good morning and welcome to today's Board of Education meeting. At this time, we'll have the roll call, please, Mr. Harrington. Mr. Bennington. I am here. Mrs. Downs. Here. Mrs. Eubank. Here. Ms. Larimer. Here. Mr. Pullman. Here. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We welcome our guests here this morning, and thank you for coming to today's board meeting. We care about the safety of you, our students, families, and guests. And please note that there are exits behind you, behind us, and there's an AED located right outside the door. At this time, we need to have a motion to adopt the proposed agenda. I will make that motion. I'll second it. <laughs> Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Harrington? Mr. Bennington? Yes. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. Mrs. Downs? Yes. Mr. Pullman? Yes. <coughs> and Mr. Hosser will give the superintendent's report. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Um, so we wanted to take a little bit of time just to uh, walk through our process. And, and simply put, when, when a student has COVID, what happens? Um, we now have been in school for, for seven weeks. We've had cases that have occurred in, in virtually every building, not all buildings, but most of our buildings. And we're at a point now where people are beginning to ask, you know, well, how, did, how do you do this? Um, why am I getting contacted? You know, why is my child having to quarantine? So we thought it would be a good exercise today just to kind of walk through that process, those guidelines. We have a team here in, in Perrysburg that works very hard. Um, with us today um, is uh, Deb Reddick, uh, our head nurse, uh, Sarah Stockwell, the director of uh, student services and, and wellness. And we're very fortunate um, to have uh, Tyler Briggs uh, with the um, Wood County um, Health Department here uh, Tyler is somebody that we rely heavily on as we go through this process. So we appreciate the county reaching out to us. And, and I think that you'll, you'll hear that throughout this presentation about how important, how closely connected we are with the county from the current uh, director, uh, Ben Robeson, to their staff. Um, you know, it's, it, when we talk about a team effort, it's, it's a team effort. Um, not with this this morning, but who play critical roles, Kit Veller, who helps with the contract tracing and, and you know, um, supporting that work. Um, and also AJ Stockwell, who's been reaching out, um, communicating with parents, generating letters, and so forth. So we're very fortunate to have this group working on keeping our students, staff, and ultimately our community safe. So, um, so with that, um, I will uh, pull up the presentation and we'll uh, ask our presenters to jump up. Good morning. We're actually really excited to talk with you guys about this because this happens so much behind the scenes. So uh, we thought it would be neat to share that information in more detail with you. So Debbie's gonna go ahead and start and give you some background. Okay, so what is the need for contact tracing and quarantine? These. These two things, uh, contact tracing, meaning identifying the people who have been in contact with an infected, COVID-infected person, and then the quarantine, meaning to you know, kind of step away for a while in order to help prevent that spread. But the, re the reason these are necessary is to limit the spread of COVID-19 further within our schools and our community. Um, if there's, uh, we have to do effective investigation, which identifies a pot potential range of uh, risks so we can keep the community protected to the best of our ability. And um, if we don't quarantine everyone who has been in contact with someone who is um, COVID positive, then there could be a larger spread of the illness, which could take out a great number of our population, either within the school buildings or within our community. So. We need to know a little bit about some of the terminology if an employee receives a report of a student or staff member who is suspected or confirmed of, co of a COVID-19 diagnosis. So suspected is a person who is suspected positive or um, if they have COVID-like symptoms 
and have had close contact with an individual who has tested positive for COVID-19. So then we need to understand what is close contact. That's defined as less than six feet for more than 15 minutes. That's cumulative time with or without a mask. And what is confirmed, a person's confirmed positive if they have a COVID um, positive 19 test with or without symptoms. So you can have asymptomatic um, COVID and not exhibit any symptoms, but a test can show that you are positive. So then we go into our communication process. Um, which is where families or employees are to report the suspected or confirmed cases of COVID to either the principal, the administrator, or one of the COVID liaison team members within 24 hours of symptoms or test results. The principal or administrator will then let the family employee know that the COVID team is going to be following up to gather more information. And that's where that, um, direct, or that close contact and um, symptoms and onset of symptoms is important. Mm -hmm. The principal or administrator then notifies the COVID team by either email, text, or phone. Um, and we do a lot of texting. <laughs> and um, the COVID team then in or immediately initiates contact tracing um, with any questions or um, we sometimes can run into some, to some pretty unusual situations, we're always in touch with the Wood County Health Department. So we have Ty our Tyler's personal <laughs> number and we're texting him, um, calling his team or emailing his team and they get back to us immediately. So we do pair with them um, weekly, sometimes daily it seems like. Um, so then um, per the Ohio Department of Health director's orders that were put out on September 3rd, all families with a member in a school building with a confirmed positive case are to be notified with general details of that um, confirmation within 24 hours of us receiving it. Those who are in close contact with a positive student or, per, or staff will receive quarantine notification within 24 hours of the district learning of either presumptive, and that again is um, someone who's been in close contact and is now showing symptoms, or a confirmed case. And then families of students in the classroom will be notified even if they were not in direct contact. Um, their letter will say that there is no further action they need to take, but we want to alert them to the fact that there was a student or a staff member in their classroom who was COVID positive. All right, so just a quick overview of uh, what the COVID team is responsible for, and we'll go into more detail um, in the following slides. But if we do um, receive a port report, we're immediately going into Power School to check for siblings. Um, if it's a staff member, we're trying to find out if there are students in the district that are their children, because we need to see how far that reach might go. Um, we go and enter information into a confidential contact tracing spreadsheet. And there's, that's where we get all the information for our reports that we put out weekly. Uh, it also allows us to track where maybe those COVID cases are happening. So we can begin to see who those carriers are. We do gather a list of possible close contacts with the suspected or confirmed individual, contact the health department obviously, and um, they answer any questions, follow any directives that they give us. We determine when they're able to return to work or school, and Debbie will go through the details of this. This is the 14-day quarantines versus the 10-day isolations. Uh, we send letters to all the families, as, as Debbie mentioned, and the employees. Send the health department the list of quarantined employees and staff members. So within a day of having the notification, within that 24 hours, we have to have the list of every student and staff member that's impacted have the letters out and then get that information to the health department. So timelines are really critical. If it comes in at 8 p.m., we have to start moving immediately. Uh, we send the health department the names and phone numbers of anyone that it notifies us that they've had a positive test or that they're that suspected positive um, within a day of notification. So as far as contact tracing goes, this has evolved over time. <laughs> Initially, um, there were lots of questions that we knew we would have to ask, and as each case has happened, this has gotten more and more refined. We've add, added more questions. Um, so is there a known exposure? So within the last 14 days of someone having symptoms, were they exposed to anyone that was COVID positive? Um, that changes the direction that we go. Uh, what is the student employee schedule? Uh, does the student have any siblings? Does the staff member have any children in the district? 
Does the student attend Pena or some sort of alternative program? And if so, where are their siblings? Are there any siblings? When did the student or employee's symptoms start? So they're contagious 48 hours prior to symptoms starting. So if a student over the weekend develops symptoms and they weren't in school on Friday, we don't have a lot of contact, we don't have any contact tracing to do. But if their symptoms start on a Thursday and they were in school on Tuesday, then we know we have to go to the high school immediately and begin contact tracing. So that, when the symptoms started, is a really critical piece of information. Uh, does the student <coughs> ride the bus? And we'll talk a little bit more about buses later. Who shares a bus stop, um, as well as who sits within three rows forward and three rows back from the student on the bus? Again, I'll explain that in a little bit more detail later. Who does the student and employee eat lunch with? So who's at their lunch table? Did the staff member go to the lounge to eat lunch? Did they eat in their classroom? Were they six feet apart? Uh, is the student in any clubs or sports? What pod is the student with at arrival and dismissal? So we've tried to um, create pods where students are not just congregating in different places at arrival and dismissal because we know for contact tracing purposes, that's really critical information. Uh, are there any other pods or cohorts? So who else is the student with that we might be missing? That's kind of a general catch-all question in there. And then there's more. <laughs> uh, what small groups does the student participate in? So we know that at the elementary, for example, students are in their classroom with their same cohort throughout the day. Uh, we try to pull from those same classrooms when we do small groups. But every once in a while, if it's a special education need, for example, the student may be with a student from another classroom. So we need to make sure we're not missing anybody. Uh, so that's a question we ask. Does the student work with or were they tested by a school counselor, academic assessor, school psychologist, CRC counselor? So these are individuals that um, testing or assessment or even just meeting with the child individually might happen and we not, might not necessarily know about it. It's not on a schedule anywhere necessarily. So to make sure we're not missing anyone, that question's there for the principals. Um, any non-traditional activities or events that maybe change the schedule, um, substitutes in the building, monitors, paraprofessionals, co-teachers, uh, all of these things are considerations that we have to make. Um, the question about teacher instruction is important because, as Debbie mentioned, it's 15 cumulative minutes. So in some of our classrooms, and it's within six feet, so in some of our classrooms, we know that the teachers are able to maintain that six feet distance uh, just because by way of the classrooms, the way that they're set up, uh, maybe if they're on the hybrid schedule, there are less students in the classroom. But if there's situations where the teacher is not able to do that, then we have to make sure that uh, we know were they in direct contact, who are they in direct contact with, um, so that we can um, share that information with the health department. So this is just information about what we gather. So we get seating charts of the classrooms, the buses, um, lunch and encore classes. We actually go out and do walkthroughs and measure. So at um, Hall Prairie Junior High and the high school, as soon as we find out, we immediately go out to those buildings and we actually take a measuring tape with us and we start measuring the classrooms to see which students were in, within six feet. Uh, we ask for rosters um, and then any other, any other information that we might need. So the school bus, there's been a lot of questions about the school bus. Uh, so the Ohio Department of Health, Ohio Department of Education and the CDC all have stated that students on buses are automatically at a higher risk because they're in a confined space. There's also other factors that come into play uh, when making determinations. So are students wearing their masks at all times? With the younger students, that may be a challenge. Um, there's one bus driver. They're concerned about the safety on the road and driving. So um, anyone that's parents and you have your children in the back seat, you know sometimes that's a challenge to be able to monitor behavior and also stay on the road safely. Um, so that's a question that comes up. Are students sitting in their assigned seats? Was there a substitute driver? Did they know where students were supposed to be sitting? Uh, were the windows up or were the windows down? So all of those factors come into play. If those are all in place, students have masks on consistently, they're sitting in their assigned seats so we know where they are, and the windows are down, we can implement the six foot rule. Meaning that we measure from where the student is sitting, six feet in, in all directions. And that typically ends up being about three rows forward and three rows backward on both sides. So it takes up about seven rows uh, is what we have measured. On smaller uh, buses, it may look a little bit different. If there is any question whatsoever, then all the students on the bus are quarantined. And uh, Tyler actually gave us this, this language that if we're unable to determine who is exposed, everyone is considered exposed. Um, so that's kind of how the decisions are made around transportation. 
uh, attendance we know is critical to not only monitor but also to support students when they're out. So the attendance secretary uh, at each building, uh, they have their own spreadsheet where they're keeping track of which students are out, what their return to work or school dates are, and they're monitoring that. So if a student or staff member comes back prior to their, their date that they're supposed to be back, they're obviously sent home immediately um, and reminded of what their date is. <coughs> The principal, while the students are out, is communicating with the students' teachers and providing, making sure that work is available to the students. Uh, we have actually delivered work to some of the younger students that might need manipulatives or different things to go along with um, you know, their packets of information. Uh, we've also delivered food bags or meals to families that are under quarantine. Uh, if the parents are also under quarantine and not, they're not able to, to leave. Um, and we obviously make sure that students are marked medically excused if they're unable to participate in those remote learning opportunities. So we're trying to do everything we can. We know this is a burden on families. Um, this is a challenge for everyone. And so we're trying to do everything we can to make sure that they're supported through this process. And Debbie's gonna talk about them coming back to, to work in school. Okay, so um, the principal or administrator or the nurse will notify the COVID liaison who, um, when test results come back so that communication can be sent to the family or the employee for return to school or work. Um, we send a return to school or work note to the family or employee. The return date will be the current date, that, so the day we receive it, or if there's another date um, that the physician has put in a note, we will put that date in. Um, so it's pretty immediate. If they get a negative COVID test, they can come back. We just need to see that note. Um, Athletic department, they collect their return to play physician releases for the athletes and forward them to the COVID team for documentation. And those families are provided with instructions and a letter they receive from the district also. Uh, there's a little bit of a caveat there for the athletic department. It depends on if the, the athlete um, was just quarantined or if they actually had symptoms. If the athlete had symptoms to return to play involves a little bit more and uh, a doctor follow up. Uh, the COVID team then follows the return to school or work guidance established with the Wood County Health Department when making the decisions on those. So again, if we ever have any questions, if something's just a little bit not um, along the realm of what we, you know, is normal, we will reach out to Wood County Health Department and get direction from them. So if a person has had a positive COVID test and symptoms, so a positive test and symptoms, they're considered isolated. I, a lot of people get confused, and if you watch the news, um, sometimes they use that word interchangeably, isolate and quarantine, but it, one way I've told students to remember is isolate has an S in it, so that means you're having symptoms and you're sick. So that's just, um, but if they've had a positive test and symptoms, they can return to school or work when they can answer yes to the, the following three questions. First of all, has it been at least 10 days since the first symptoms started? Has it been at least three days or 24 hours? I guess so we're, we're going with 72 hours, sorry. Um, since the, the person had a fever without fever reducing medicines, and that's within, that can be within that 10 days. But if we get to day nine of symptoms or of that isolation period and you're still having a fever, you know, we're gonna push that out until you've been fever free with no fever reducing medicines for 72 hours. And then has it been at least 72 hours since the um, individual symptoms have improved, including coughing and shortness of breath. So we wanna see some improvement in those symptoms for at least three days before they return to school or work. And if a person has a positive COVID test but does not have symptoms, they too will remain out of school for 10 days. And um, until from the date of their positive test, assuming they haven't developed symptoms during the latter part of those 10 days. So um, 10 days is the rule, and again, we need to make sure that they're fever free and improve symptoms prior to returning. If a person has a negative COVID test and has no known exposure to a positive or presumptive positive person, they can return to school once there um, is no fever for 24 hours without fever reducing medicines. And that's our normal illness guidelines that we typically follow in a normal year. If a person was in direct contact or close contact, um, again, less than six feet for greater than a cumulative 15 minutes with or without a mask, with someone who was diagnosed with COVID and they're not having symptoms, 
then they're quarantined, and that's the 14-day timeout. They, sh they have to remain out of school for 14 days since the last date of known contact. They have to complete the full 14 days, even if they go get a negative test. Um, the reason being, we, we have had this happen, you might you know, go get a negative test on day seven, but you still have seven more days where symptoms could possibly start. So there might not be enough viral load to show that they are positive. So we do have to wait that for full 14 days. If they later test positive, then we go back to onset of symptoms and they would isolate for 10 days. It's a little confusing. <laughs> and that's why Tyler and his team are so helpful. Okay, so if a person was in direct contact, maybe, it, am I on the next one? Okay, um, again, our close contact, less than six feet for more than 15 minutes with someone who was diagnosed with COVID and has symptoms, they can return to school or work, just like we had said before, when they can answer yes to the three questions. Has it been at least 10 days since you first had symptoms? Has it been at least three days since you've had no fever with no fever reducing medicines? And at least three days since symptoms have started improving, including the cough and shortness of breath. If a, a person or a student has COVID-like symptoms at school or their home and the parent calls, the nurse in the building will screen that call or screen that person. It's either in person or over the phone. And if there are a couple, um, several COVID-like symptoms, they will be, will be sent home. The way they can return to school, there's, there's three different ways they can return to school, either with a physician's note indicating that there's a different di an alternative diagnosis that dis um, uh, explains the COVID-like symptoms, um, and they are fever-free without fever-reducing medicines for 24 hours, or with a negative COVID test um, and no known exposure to someone who was COVID positive or presumptive positive, or they can answer yes to the following three questions. Again, <laughs> our famous three questions of 10 days since onset, the three days of fever-free, and three days of improved symptoms. If a person has been hospitalized for COVID-19, again, the same 10-day isolation rules apply. Their, their uh, timeout might be a little bit longer, but we will require a physician's re, um, note to release them to return to school or work just because some of those, uh, we wanna make sure that that person is really ready. Um, it can really take a while for some people to bounce back and we don't want anybody there too early and you know, causing them to have a, a recurrence or uh, other issues that happen. If a person is exposed to a confirmed positive in their household, this gets to be extremely tricky because there's a lot of factors we have to consider. If further contact in the house can be avoided through complete isolation, and that means the student or employee um, who is ill is in a room by themselves, you know, if possible, their own bathroom, there's no intermingling of family members, then that student or employee must quarantine for 14 days from the last date of exposure to the confirmed positive. Um, if further contact cannot be avoided, maybe there's a lot of people in the house, it's a smaller house or an apartment, um, then the student or employee must quarantine for 14 days um, after the ill person or the confirmed positive person has completed their 10-day isolation and can answer yes to those three questions then that person's quarantine starts. So it will end up being about 24 days where they will be out. And that only applies if the student or the employee is not having symptoms. If at any point they do begin having symptoms, then they go into isolation for the 10 day period. We will have a quiz after. Did you get all that? <laughs> so you can see why it's so critical that the health department has, is partnering with us on this and helping us through this. It has taken um, a long time for us to grasp all of these rules and every scenario is so different. So we are constantly going over all of these questions and all of these return to work situations. And it can change very quickly, especially if you have a family where someone is symptomatic or tested positive. So. Um, one of the things that recently came out uh, per the Department of Homeland Security is the idea of essential workers. So pre-K through 12 um, educators and staff members are now considered essential workers. So what this means is that they have the option of returning to work while under quarantine. So 
During those 14 days when they're supposed to be quarantined in their home, if they are not symptomatic, they're allowed to return to work under the following conditions. So obviously they have to continue to monitor, self-monitor their own symptoms on a daily basis. Do I have a fever? Do I have a cough? Any of the COVID-like symptoms. Wear a face mask while in the workplace at all times. Maintain six feet from others at all times. So walking in the hallway, anywhere you are, you have to be able to maintain six feet distance. Um, obviously refrain from sharing headsets, work materials, anything like that and they're only released to go to work. So once they go home, they have to quarantine. Before and after work, um, the quarantine rules stay in place. Uh, this information has been updated and put into our letters that employees receive if they're required to quarantine. We only use this option if it's possible to follow all of those guidelines. So you can imagine at some of the younger grade levels, that might be a challenge and nearly impossible to maintain six feet distance between yourself and a kindergartner or yourself and a second grader. So we imagine this will probably be used a little bit more at the upper grades. In addition, what the employer must do is obviously require the employee to perform those daily symptoms checks, which is already part of our requirements for every staff member. Increase cleaning and disinfecting of the workspaces, offices, bathroom, common areas, anything that the employee uses, and the administrator will be communicating this with a custodian if this, if this occurs. Send the employee home immediately if symptoms develop. So obviously that's part of our um, normal requirements anyhow, but then there'd be an additional cleaning. So there'd be a deep sanitation, cleaning and disinfecting of surfaces the employee touched. We would obviously contact the health department right away and we would start going through that process of contact tracing if they deemed that necessary. So that was a lot of information. Um, I think we want to just go through a couple case studies just to share with you um, a, a, few, a couple cases that actually happened within, I don't know, two days of each other. Um, so we had an elementary case and then also a Perrysburg High School case that happened within two to three days. Um, different results and so we just wanted to walk you through what that looked like. So on the elementary situation, the parent called to let us know that their child was positive. Uh, so they actually called the, the COVID team. Um, and at, an, at the elementary level, we aren't required to measure because in that situation, it's automatically the entire classroom that's quarantined. Um, so we, at that, in that situation, immediately text the principal, let the principal know who starts gathering the information that's necessary. A couple days later, um, a high school situation, the Wood County Health Department had requested that the family get tested, um, and there were several siblings in the district due to a family member being positive. Uh, the parent called to let us know that the student, a couple of the students, had tested positive. Um, the child had been in school during the contagious period, so going back 48 hours, they had been in school. So in that case, we immediately went to the high school, and we started measuring classrooms, um, getting the student schedule and gathering all the information that we needed. Uh, if you go to the next slide, this kind of shows how that um, fell out and you can see the difference between an elementary versus a high school situation. So at the elementary, luckily the student was not in any reading groups. They were not in the special education services. They stayed with their classroom or their cohort for lunch. Um, and the Encore teachers were pushing in, but there was no close contact. So this was actually a um, better result, I guess, if you will. We had to quarantine less students in this situation, but the entire class resulted in 23 students. A portion of the bus throw that three rows forward, three rows backward, was 26 students, and then the classroom teacher. At the high school, um, due to them being on the hybrid schedule, uh, there was a lot more space, I guess, if you will, so they were able to distance much better. Um, the teachers were very cautious about kind of staying at their desk. All of them have said to us, we, we talk face to face or on the phone with each teacher, and all of them have said, this is very challenging. This is not how I learned to teach, staying behind my desk, putting a bubble between me and students. Um, but they know that because of the health crisis that we're in, that it's necessary. So what that allowed is no teachers to be quarantined at that level. There were only eight <coughs> students in the classes, and some classrooms had no students that needed to be quarantined just by way of how the classroom was set up. Um, and then students at lunch ended up being seven. So you can see less students at the high school um, were quarantined in that situation. And in that case, there were no sports clubs, anything like that that came into play as well. I'm good, yep. This is Tyler, I don't know if there's anything, we have a few more slides we'll go through. I don't know if there's anything that we've covered up to this point you'd like to jump in on or, or add or or a comment, or do you want to wait till we're all done? Uh, I can wait till the end. All right, okay. 
So we know that we've received questions, um, you know, um, the, and, and here are some, some of the sample questions that we've received from different individuals. Um, so, you know, who makes the decision as to who's quarantined? Um, why do we receive an email from the school and not a call from the health department or a COVID team member? Uh, is the school district following the CDC and Wood County Health Department guidelines or do we make our own? Um, do you know how disruptive this is to students and families? Um, why doesn't the school district tell me who is positive? And why doesn't the school district bring all the students back full time every day? So we wanted to kind of address a few of these. Um, first of all, the Wood County Health Department establishes the guidelines and we follow those guidelines. Um, it's, it's pretty clear with the CDC and, and Wood County Health Department in terms of, you know, six feet, 15 minutes, um, that's pretty clear. But you've heard several situations where they've actually had to clarify different kinds of situations. And any time that that does happen, we, we work closely with the health department to do that. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, in, in that, the, the, let's see, it was uh, just over a week ago on a Friday, I think it was late afternoon, so like right around 3 o'clock p.m. on a Friday, um, we had two different cases that were coming in that the team was working, and we ended up having to notify 157 different people. So imagine having to call people on a Friday, you know, after measuring physically, you know, I, I meant to bring a, a measuring tape to just kind of actually measuring classrooms, checking seating charts, going into the buildings, and then having to call 157 people. The best and, and most effective way for us to reach those is through our notification email system. And certainly if parents have calls or questions, they, they get a hold of us or email us back. Um, but to, to, you know, to get to all of those with a phone message, um, you know, our point is to try to prevent Saturday morning showing up at grandma and grandpa's house um, and, and us having to delay because we need to make that personal phone call. So, um, so that's something that we're, you know, we, we you know, the way that we do it. Um, by us doing the contact tracing, um, it does uh, speed up the process because we have all of this information. We have families' emails, we have families' uh, contact information, we have their schedules, everything. If we were to turn all this over and not take the step, it may take the health department, their staff, uh, a few days, and I'll defer to Tyler, but it might take a few days longer to make these connections than, than us, and, and we felt it was important to, to stop the spread in the community to, to act as quickly as possible using our staff to do that. Um, and um, I know that, are we following the guidelines in the health department or are we making up our own? And I think the presentation shows, you know, we're, we're adhering um, to the health department guidelines um, and that's something that I think is important. Um, we certainly understand the, the frustration level. Um, and the board knows that we began this, you know, what is school going to look like before the governor gave his guidelines back in July 2nd, um, talking about what can we do to bring as many students back for the greatest amount of time possible while being safe and reducing spread. And, and I think that's always been our focus. That's always been our, our motivation. So when we have a case and 157 students are, are quarantined or st students and staff are quarantined, um, that's heartbreaking for us because everything that we've done has been to put students, you know, in, in school as, as much as possible. And, um, and so we, we understand the impact that that has. Um, two Friday nights ago, the family that was two rows ahead of me because you have to sit every couple rows away, um, had a family member that was on their second quarantine. And this is concerning for us um, because we know that if we continue to have cases pop up where families are having their children sit out for, for multiple stretches just by bad luck, um, we worry that families are going to stop reporting. We worry that families are going to stop um, you know, having their students tested and, and that kind of a thing. So, so that, that is a concern to us, that, that, that balance. Um, and, and so, but we understand that. 
I know there's um, questions about our, our um, you know, why, why can't you give me the name of the teacher? Why can't you give me the name of the student that tested positive? Um, we have something called the Family Educational Right to Privacy Act, which is FERPA, where we can't share personally identifiable information. Um, the weekly report that we put out, we can't, um, we, we don't want to put anything on that report where you could probably identify or trace back that student. Uh, let's say in an elementary where there aren't as many cases. If we were to say this is a third grader at this building, it would be pretty easy to figure out who that student is. So we have to be careful to protect that. But we've been very transparent with the information that we're sharing and how much and doing so long before the governor re required school districts to, to share this information. And you know, the question is, are we going to be in this for a long time? And, and that's the million dollar question. Um, we evaluate every single week what's happening in the community, what's happening in the schools, because we don't want to stay in the hybrid any longer than we have to. Um, and, and our goal is to get students back and do it in a way that keeps them, their families, um, the staff safe. Um, and it doesn't disrupt what's happening. Um, and you, you, with the numbers that we put out, this is this past week's numbers, um, you know, COVID is still active in the community. Um, in, in fact, um, I think this week you'll hear that we saw an uptick. Um, we, we saw an increase of about 89 cases per 100,000 from where we were two weeks ago in Wood County. So that means that, you know, we're a reflection of the community. If there are more cases happening in the community, we can expect more cases happening in schools. Um, and you know, so our challenge is, if we put 150, 1,700 high school students together in, a, in like a bag and shake them all up every 50 minutes and put 10 kids at a lunchroom table, when that one student tests positive, that six, fi six uh, feet of measuring is going to, to net a larger number of students. So we will have more students having to quarantine for two weeks at a time. We will have more students being off. Um, and, and that is the balance that we're struggling with. So we're watching closely. I think anything that we do is going to be done incrementally. And what I mean is, you know, let's not bring all 1,700 students back, put them in a baggie and shake them up. But <laughs> are there ways that we can bring students back, you know, by grade level or more frequently, um, you know, and, and that's what we're really focusing on, is how can we do that given where we are with our numbers and, and certainly what's happening. Um, so um, in, in Wood County, this, is the, this will be coming out, but 47% of the cases in the last two weeks where we saw this increase have been, and 47% um, of the cases are, stu are, are people in between the ages of 20 and 29. So this is affecting that younger, um, you know, crowd. In, in students age zero to 19, 27% of that increase of, of those cases are students who are in that K-12 range of, of, of age. So this is something that has been the fear. Um, when we had Dr. Hanrahan uh, come and speak to the board, um, you know, earlier on in, in July, uh, she talked about the concern, and, and then um, uh, Ben Beatty, who was then the Wood County Health Director, talked about the concern about the fall, when people are more indoors, when it becomes less humid, the virus has the ability to, to, to survive a little bit longer, to, to travel a little bit further, and this is a concern. So, so we're just you know, really watching this with the idea that we want to continue to ask the question, when can we do this? When can we make an adjustment? When can we get more kids in? But looking at all the factors and all the different lenses that we have to do. Um, so, you know, that continues to be our challenge and, um, you know, our, our work. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to, to Ben if you want to say anything and comments and questions. So. I'm sorry, I, I tied that. <laughs> um, so if you could step up to the mic, sorry. Yeah. So 
probably better than that way they can under. hear it in yeah, the absolutely. streaming. Yeah. Everyone okay to hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I am one of two epidemiologists for the county. Uh, I am technically, I guess, the longer running epidemiologist, so <laughs> hence why I'm here. <laughs> um, I've been working very closely with Perrysburg schools. I would say uh, this district has probably been one of our more vocal districts, but that is honestly a very good thing. Um, from anyone who's gone through the educational system or currently works in the educational system, if you get questions, that shows that people are paying attention. I don't want you to have informed consent because you, you know, don't understand the material or you're too frustrated to ask a question. Um, so when we get parents that ask questions, we take that as a very good thing. Um, now, Perrysburg has been doing a lot of their contact tracing internally, and we severely appreciate that because, yes, um, you all are working with a 5,539 student population. We're working with roughly 130,000 individuals on a daily basis. Um, so what that means for us is we are here as a resource to help any way we possibly can. Um, the school is the initial step. They provide excellent information at that um, initial phase. And then if questions are needed to be answered, we are certainly there for them, parents, um, administrators, whomever would need to speak to us. Um, but we do release information on a protected basis. If somebody calls and wants to know, is my child exposed? We have that quarantine list in hand for that reason, because we don't often get this, but people do want to try to trick us. It doesn't so much happen with schools uh, for quarantining purposes because people want to keep their kid in school as opposed to keeping them out. Um, but we need to verify information to the best of our ability. And going back to the bus issue, if we can't guarantee that guidance was followed, we typically will err on the side of caution. Um, I, while I can say that there have not been any um, pediatric associated deaths to COVID in the county, um, all of our deaths do tend to um, sway toward the higher age um, and comorbid class. We also know that children may not develop symptoms but can certainly spread illness. I would say anywhere between 30 and 40% of our cases in the county have remained asymptomatic. Um, but I can also tell you that those cases who have remained asymptomatic, um, if it's a husband, their wife gets it and vice versa and their children, if they're uh, children that require mom and dad's constant attention, you know, elementary age school kids, which is why the guidance again is what it is. Um, and then I did wanna talk about some of the questions that we receive, um, cause we typically get more of the, I guess, in depth questions uh, relating to virology, which is uh, very entertaining for me because no one knew my job existed <laughs> six months ago. And now I get more calls than ever, which is great. If, if I can reach the person and educate them, I would prefer that over WTOL any day. Um, <laughs> no offense to the news, but they do want your attention I want your understanding. Uh, I'm not <laughs> endorsed by anyone. My education has not corrupted me. Um, <laughs> but one of the questions we do typically get is, what test will get me out of quarantine early? And Sarah and Deb did mention, you don't get tested out of quarantine. If you're exposed, you are exposed. The reason being that test is a snapshot in time. Um, I would use the example, and it's a crude example, forgive me, but if you were to take a picture of me throwing a punch at your face, good luck getting that picture developed before my punch hits you in the face. It's, it's that quick. You really don't know. You could literally test negative in the morning and be positive that afternoon. The viral load is very sensitive. The testing we use is also very sensitive. However, the uh, infectious load dose has to be at a detectable level. Um, we also get the question, I had one test positive, one test negative, which one do I listen to? Um, the RNA-PCR test is a genetic test. It detects at a molecular level the specific genetic material of the virus. It is extremely sensitive. It is our only diagnostic test. If you have a negative PCR and any other positive antibody or antigen test, the PCR is always the primary test that we take the result from. Now that's not to say that a clinician will not give a diagnosis of COVID-19. In that case, the physician completely overrules the health department and we defer to them. Again, it's more erring on the side of caution. 
We have seen instances, not in children, but in elderly individuals that have um, clinical signs and symptoms uh, and even chest imagery of COVID-19 who test negative for PCR and the physician gives a clinical diagnosis. In those circumstances, we will defer to the physician's choice. Um, I don't think that will be an issue for our students, but it might be an issue for a parent, grandparent, that may lead to some contact tracing here in the school, depending on our exposures. Um, another question is, uh, and this is more of like the broad example, if I'm in a restaurant, why do I have to wear it when I walk in, but I don't have to wear it while I'm seating at my table before my food gets there? Because obviously you can't wear a mask when you're eating. Um, and I would say to that, there is a spectrum of risk when it comes to everything we do. Um, if you go to a restaurant, you should wear your mask when your food's not there because this limits exposure. Same thing with the six feet, 15 minutes. Is that a guarantee? Absolutely not. But you're such low risk at that point that if we didn't set it somewhere that where we can determine where a more high risk exposure is um, you know, applicable, you would be considered exposed anytime you leave your house. And really, I would stress that attitude for everyone. I have individuals call and say, why didn't you call, uh, make a press release that there was a case at McDonald's? I went to McDonald's, I deserve to know. If you're following the state guidelines and the federal guidelines, as well as McDonald's should be implementing, there's no way that a customer should be in close contact with a McDonald's employee. And again, there are certain things that we have to do and certain things that we shouldn't do right now, and we need to all measure that risk. I've had parents call and say, why can I go to the casino and play blackjack and I could have been exposed. I was there for three hours, but my daughter was possibly exposed and now she has to quarantine. And to that I would say, your kid has to go to school. You don't have to go and play blackjack. You're, <laughs> we're all taking an informed consent here. And again, this isn't meant to be cruel. I'm not trying to punish anyone or restrict people. I'm just trying to get people to understand that we're all making adjustments. I think the education system has making some of the strictest adjustments of any of us. As far as bar and restaurants go, they're in the same boat. Uh, not too many places can operate at 50% capacity. Luckily with the state guidelines, we were able to determine uh, at a district level what we want to do. And I think Perrysburg had you know, the technology here in place to make things available with hybrid method, in person when possible, or total distance learning. Other districts have taken in-person uh, classes, and I can't speak be due to FERPA, of course, but some districts are, of course, going to see an increased risk because of those issues. Um, anytime we can limit exposure, I would, again, extremely stress it. Um, when this all came about, I know that people were concerned about mortality um, it, for really everyone. I can tell you now, based off the data we're seeing, it, it is the old and the sick who get this. This is a coronavirus, which is typically a common cold virus. However, with any novel strain of virus, it affects each of us differently. It's a self-limiting virus. Um, as Sarah and I were talking before this, we isolate the individual for the 10 days, 24 hours, to ensure that they're not shedding live virus. And most individuals, I would even say upwards of 90%, hit that mark well within that timeline. It's typically five, six days. They're better by the end of that. We still finish the 10 days, of course, and then they're released. However, we do have cases, young, very rarely, more of the elderly and those with comorbidities, that require 15, 20 days. So if we're very conscious of that situation and those that we can affect, it might only give me a head cold. It's a small inconvenience to me. My American work ethic says I can go to work. It's my responsibility as an American citizen not to go to work right now. We're in the middle of a pandemic. I don't know whom I could expose at work. Same thing if I feel kind of crappy, I shouldn't go to the grocery store or I shouldn't go to the gym or whatever other exposures. Is it an inconvenience? Absolutely. But it's a way larger inconvenience to be dead. And while I might not die, I could kill someone's father, grandmother, or so on. Um, so with that, I mean, that's, I really don't want to drag on too much. I apologize for being a little hot-winded. It's a very passionate subject, that, and we deal with it on a very regular basis. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So I'll turn it over. Any board members have any questions and comments? I have a couple things, and thank you, Mrs. Stockwell, Mrs. Reddick, and Mr. Briggs. 
uh, your information is valuable. I know, I know Mr. Hostler, since I think July 20th and the first information you sent the board on uh, the COVID quarantine, the testing, the isolation, the packet was sent out. We've had five sent to us as a board to read and go through. And I think the latest one was updated from the CDC August 26th. And then another one was out uh, this past September. A lot of information for the safety of our students and our, st and our staff, which I'm thankful for. My question would be um, with respect to the um, busing. I heard it today. I didn't read it before. Maybe I, didn't, maybe I missed it. Are we communicating to the community, to the parents, that the busing is a high risk? That's, that word is the first time I saw associated with busing. And it could just be my, my not reading that before. It might be in other handouts. Because it is high risk. It sounds to me it's pretty high risk. Want me to take that one, Tom? I'm sure. Yeah, so we have not done a mass communication to families about that. The questions are just now starting to pop up. So as I had mentioned in the presentation, each case we learn something new and we revise and we refine what we're doing. Um, I think this was an opportunity for us to share with not only the board but the public um, some of those questions and answers that we're getting about transportation. And then I think from here we're gonna make a determination as to what maybe that next piece of communication should look like. Yeah, I also appreciate what I've heard as a board member with busing automatically everybody's gone. It's not automatic. It just happened to be we had a case where everybody was off the bus because we couldn't tell how that quarantine would take place. So that, I'm glad you cleared yeah, that Yeah, and up. I think that and, and I think the other is where that student is located on the bus just mm -hmm. by luck, even if with the assigned seating. So we have about three to four rows as a buffer behind the driver so that, you know, in, in the case where we're measuring with the actual measuring tape, the driver is never in that calculation, even to the closest student. However, if that student is positioned in the middle of the bus, mm -hmm. that, that seven rows that, that Sarah talked about, um, then that's gonna take out a higher number. And you know the, the, the balance, and we talked about this back in July when we talked about this plan, is you know we know with, we have to get students to school. And by law, we have to transport students in grades K through eight. And if we only do one, one child every other seat, we're talking about having 13 students on a bus. And we would not be able to have elementary students every single day. Um, and, and, and so those are the kind of trade-offs because the health piece is very serious. And, and I think that's well established. But also we have to keep in mind that we have an obligation to social, emotional, academic needs of our students as well. And it's trying to find that right balance of providing, you know, uh, providing that for our students in the safest way possible. And you know, that's where that quarantine and the numbers start to, to impact. If we don't like the number of students that are being quarantined, the answer is have fewer students you know, exposed, which means attend less. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's the dilemma and that's the struggle that we're facing all the time. Um, and um, we said at the very beginning we need to be flexible and, and you know, I think we are. And I, like, again, we, we're always looking and asking what's the next, you know, could we make that incremental step? And, you know, and looking at the numbers, you know, part of that conversation is, you know, Tom, here's the numbers for this past two weeks is now the time to do that when we've seen an uptick in Wood County? Is now the time to bring back all the junior high students for four days a week? Is, is now really the time to do that? And that's what we're continually discussing with health experts, so. So yeah, the, the, the luck of the draw in terms of where you seat can, can dictate that, so. I've got um, two questions. Um, can you go over the requirements for siblings once a student is quarantined? So if a student is quarantined and the sibling has not had direct contact or close contact with anyone, they're able to return to school. The family dynamics come into play when there's a family member in the home, so a parent, a sibling, a grandparent, aunt or uncle that live in the household that 
either test positive or they're considered um, presumptive or suspected as positive by the health department standards. In that situation, that's where the family um, information that Debbie went over where that positive person has to be able to isolate within the home, then this other student would quarantine and that would either be the 14 days or 24 plus days depending on what the family is able to do. Okay, so if you had a student that was quarantined, other siblings do not need to quarantine? Correct. Okay, okay. And then can you, um, what if there's a situation where somebody disagreed, where they thought their child was not in the tracing incident? Tracing. So, yeah, no, that's a great question, because we've had that happen. Um, we have parents who will email us and say, my child wasn't in school that day. So we verify attendance, and then we send them a disregard quarantine letter. So. There's no way with 150 plus students in some of these quarantines that we're gonna get every single one right. Um, we're not able to manually go in and check attendance on each of those students. So we send it out to anyone that um, is in that group that should have been in school and then parents will let us know. Um, there's been a few situations where families have said, yeah, my child's on the bus roster because we thought we would need transportation, but I've been driving them to school. So great, your child gets to come back to school. If we can return students to school, we just need to verify that that information is correct. Um, another situation I can think of is a family uh, had previously uh, been tested positive with COVID and the student, I think it's a 90 day, correct me if I'm wrong, Tyler, but if they've tested positive, they have 90 days where they don't have to quarantine any longer. So we had a case where that happened. The family said, oh, it was over the summer. You know, I didn't let you guys know, but they did test positive. So we verified with the health department and then we were able to release that student from quarantine to come back. Gotcha. And then I have one question for the gentleman. I forget your name, I'm sorry. Tyler, okay, so um, with your background and um, where do you see like moving forward with COVID? Do you think in like August 2021, we'll still be doing like a hybrid model or um, like what do you foresee with your knowledge, how this is all gonna play out with or without a vaccine? Cause obviously we can't um, demand people get a vaccine to come back to school. So, that, that's a good question, and I can tell you uh, I'm probably not the best person to ask because I'm not very political, and I would not have thought that some of the restrictions that have occurred um, would still be in place, let alone occurred in the first place. Um, I did expect schools to kind of have what happened, uh, the shutdown, because of what we knew was going to happen as far as spread goes based on what we saw in Wuhan, China, when this all started. I would say we're looking at this for at least the next six months to 12 months as far as um, mass spread of COVID because if a vaccine um, on schedule is released as they're saying it will be, um, it's going to be the susceptible population. I wouldn't expect general population vaccine to be available until late next year. So I think honestly, um, I, I would really tell people to stress that we might be in this for the long haul, so per hope for the best, but expect the worst. Thank you. I, I have a question um, either for, um, for the administration. Looking at the, the, the new cases this week, 26, are you able to say how many of those typically come from within the school, you know, a, a spread from student to student, employee to student versus how much of that is coming from outside activities or outside the school? Um, we've been uh, tracing since July when, when the state said that students could return to training and conditioning and, and those kinds of activities. So since school has begun and we have been quarantining students as described you know, earlier today, we have not seen um, any student to student, staff to student or uh, student to staff transmission that, that we're aware of. Now, there, there could be a case of somebody who's asymptomatic, who spread and they're under quarantine and they don't know and they don't get tested. So it's not 100% accurate that I can say that, but we have not had any of those kind of, of cases where, you know, I was sitting next to somebody who had it in class, it's my only contact, now I have it, 
and, and we've not had that. So Sarah, I don't know if there's anything you wanna. Yeah, no, typically um, it, students that are siblings in the district, obviously within the household, we've seen um, spread there, uh, but it's, you know, the gatherings outside of school, the events, those types of things. It's also that 20 to 29 age bracket that Tom had mentioned. Um, sometimes there are students of that age living in the household. There's college students that come home from college. And so we begin to see some of the spread there too. Um, that's typically, or uh, parents who are working in college and university settings, those are where we're start, the pockets that we're seeing this come from. So pretty easy to conclude. I mean, the efforts you guys have taken on are working the, to, to contain this spread. Yeah, and I think that's the good news, bad news. I think the good news is we're not having that transmission, mm -hmm. and, and certainly that's great. The bad news is we have parents who know my child was quarantined for 14 days. They never had it. I've never heard of another student that's had it. Now I'm getting my second time on quarantine. We're going to miss all of this instruction face to face. We're going to miss these, you know, activities, and that's getting parents frustrated. Um, and you know, there's, you know, um, cases where you know, measuring literally in the cafeteria, the student sits here at a table of four, six feet from that. You go around the <laughs> perimeter of that seat, and the next table behind them, students sitting back to back, five feet, six inches, that student is quarantined. That parent is saying, are you kidding me? You know, our, we have a three-story roof, it's a wide open area, you know, and the, the answer is heartbreaking, and it's, mm -hmm. that's, that's why, you know, that is six feet. And it's changing, and I think that's ha added the difficulty to parents too. I think last night or this morning I heard from the CDC that it's actually longer than six feet, and I haven't even had time to, to really dig into that. Um, but it's those kind of messages that come out that, that, you know, parents hear one thing and then three weeks later it's like, well, how does that happen? And, and it adds to that questioning. So. So it's kind of the good news, bad news. Good news is, yeah, we're not seeing that spread. Bad news is parents are scratching their heads sometimes and saying, then why? And somebody compared it to, you know, if you see somebody in a rainstorm with an umbrella and you say, well, you're, you know, Eric, you're dry. Give me your umbrella, you don't need it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so part of it is, is it because of those precautions that we're not seeing? And if we begin to change those precautions, are we going to end up seeing that start to happen? And that's the dilemma. Can I add to that real quick, yeah, Tom? Yeah. So I think the other piece too, um, even though we haven't necessarily seen that spread within a classroom, we do know that students are gathering outside of school. And so we have had, I think our COVID team can confidently say, we have had situations where we have quarantined a large number of students or even a small number of students who have then become symptomatic. And because we were able to so quickly move and within that 24 hours have those students quarantined, they didn't return to school, they didn't expose other students and it could have limited a much larger spread. So it is working in, in lots of cases, like Tom said, we don't see those symptoms pop up, but we have in several situations and um, felt confident that it worked, so. Okay, one Great. of the things Thank that um, I'm hearing, and, I, and I, as you talk, all three of you, it's fantastic, your passion for this. In other words, um, Mr. Briggs, I'm glad you talked about community responsibility, because it's important for us when we see things outside of school activities, that our school activities outside the school day, we're, we're asked to wear a mask, regardless if we like the mask or not, or our political affiliation, we wear a mask because we're asked to do so for our community. I appreciate what you're saying, and Mrs. Reddick and Mrs. Stockwell, your work on a late th Friday night or Saturday morning or Sunday <laughs> to get the quarantine letters and information out, and your knowledge is very beneficial to our district. We th thank you for that. My question for Mr. Hostler, um, how are we providing as a district support for the quarantine students as far as their academics are concerned? Is there some game plan we have for those students? Yeah. Um, you know, when we knew coming back into the school year that we would be having these pockets of students that would be kind of floating in and out of classrooms because of being quarantined or isolated. And um, so we have at the secondary level, um, well, first of all, K-12, we have built in that remote Monday. And the remote Monday is an opportunity for teachers to not have students in front of them, but to be able to upload, share materials for those students who might be home on quarantine, 
uh, have them contact them during the day, kind of office hours. Um, but upload for that whole week, plan for that week to get that material um, to them. And um, with the, the high school, junior high being in the hybrid where students are, you know, getting home instruction three days a week, you know, um, those students still can participate in three-fifths of the classes even though they're at home. At the elementary level, that, that Monday becomes a critical day where, where teachers can, um, you know, upload, provide materials and, and support. During the, the day when they're teaching, it's really hard for that teacher to connect with that uh, student at home. And that um, we're, we're grateful to have our staff that really, you know, goes over and above and makes those contacts, you know, at home or evening hours as much as they, you know, as much as they can. So when, when somebody is homesick with pneumonia last year, they might be out for a week or two weeks. We would send materials home, make sure the students, you know, keeping up. So there's an element of that kind of approach um, and then working hard to get those students caught up when they do return. Um, so that, that seems to be the best format for us, you know, right now. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. First is how, how do we, how do we meld the president's comments of don't let this rule your life this is nothing, you'll get better. How do we meld that in with our message to parents that this is ruling your life? You know, because it is ruling their lives. Everything we're doing, it, 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 the, the pandemic has ruled our lives. There's no question about it. So what, what do you say to the parents who say, well, you know what, the president got it, he's well, he just went on TV, he said, don't let this rule your life. So how do we as a school district respond to that in an apolitical way? So I think, I think first of all, we're, we're grateful that the president's doing well. We're grateful that anyone who gets it is, is doing well. And, and certainly we wanna you know, make sure that, uh, that, that we, we have that, uh, understanding that that above all we need to make sure that that um, we're, we're grateful for that um, I think we understand that while the president is saying this is you know the, the things that you said that's great that maybe at this point in time that's his experience because every case as you heard from from Tyler and, and Sarah and Deb every case is a little bit different and, and I think our, our folks in our community know that while the president had that outcome, there are people that we know and we love and care about who did not have that same experience. So I think people are able to maybe look at it through different lenses and say, you yeah, know, that's great for him and, and we're grateful for that. But what about my neighbor who fill in the blank? Or what about my son's teacher who is carrying oxygen to class? What about those because it it, it do, you do see that so you have to respect it um, and I think that's it is try to reduce that risk have an understanding that this can in, be impactful for different people and it's kind of like lightning I mean how many of us know someone who's been struck by lightning I mean I don't know anyone personally but when it's when you see lightning and hear thunder you don't run outside and play you take precautions and I think this virus is a lot like lightning you know yeah maybe it maybe it's not gonna hit me and chances are it won't but it's scary and you have to respect it and I think that's the approach so you know to use that analogy um, you know when you see lightning you pull call the kids in even though the chances of getting hit by lightning maybe are, aren't as great you still take those precautions and I think that has to be our approach so you don't the person who finishes their golf game in, in the lightning storm and says, you know, don't let it rule your life, you're like, yeah, I'm not gonna go out there, that's okay. And I think that's how we have to take a look at okay. it. So. I think that's a good, good thoughts. Uh, my second question is, with the latest um, CDC definition of maybe 10 feet of um, lasting 
in the air longer if you are an athlete or you are in choir. Um, what, what can we as a district do like, to improve the ventilation in our buildings? Is there a possibility that we could take one year's worth of the PI levy and like I go into the dental office and there are individual room air purifiers in every room. Could we use some PI funds to improve ventilation systems? Um, you know, there, there, there are a handful of things that as we are planning for the permanent improvement levy, it's not a new tax. It is something that we have to use just for um, uh, bricks and mortar type things. So one of the things that we have been talking about and we have quotes on, on it are several things that I think will help fight this. And you heard Tyler say, this is something that's not gonna go away in you know New Year's Eve. So uh, one of the things that, that is of interest to us and, and um, I think we're beginning to take steps to install this this year at, at HPI and then with the, the PI funds at the other buildings but is uh, a, uh, a system that, that fits into our existing HVAC system that does, uh, through ionization, do something to the virus to, to make it a little bit larger and then have the filtration where they get hung up. And then that kills the, you know, kills the virus and stops it from spreading. So as air is being circulated in the building, it's running through this system. Um, and so that is something that we are doing, um, you know, um, we're starting with that building because that building, you know, is, as we've talked about, has been our most challenging building. The students are larger, the classrooms, you know, we, they're, they're all together. Um, but with the PI funds, we're looking at trying to maybe expand that to all of the buildings. And we think that not only for COVID-19, but for other viruses spreading, that would be a benefit just in trying to keep everybody uh, healthier. Um, phasing in things like touchless faucets um, where people aren't touching things and reducing that as much as possible. Um, that's also something that we've slated onto the, to P, the PI as well. Um, and, um, you know, finally the, you know, we talked about busing here, but having a system on every single bus where students take their ID cards and swipe, it shows exactly what time they were on the bus. They swipe when they get off, it shows where they were dropped off exactly you know who was on the bus for that period of time the length of time they're on the bus one of the things that we hear from parents well my child was not on the bus for 15 minutes and you know we have to have those kind of conversations here we can actually pull the the data from that and say yes this is you know this is what we have so there, there's some things that we're beginning to see pop up that that will help us not only for COVID, but i think it's there's long-term implications of of healthier buildings so, um, you know, the filtration systems that you see in a small space could be a plug-in and it does that, but our buildings are, are quite, you know, classrooms are 900 square feet typically and larger. Um, so I think having a, a, a system that, you know, does it across the whole building is really our goal, so. So our best advice to parents who are saying, let's get the kids back to school Let's have them in school all day, every day. Our best advice would be vote for the PI levy and we will try to put in better filtration. Um, I don't know, it just, it seems, seems like we're working really hard to keep our schools open and I hope we can get the filtration, the ventilation improved in all of our buildings. That's the other thing. If, if they had the windows open on the bus, all windows open on the bus all year, okay. Now kids are gonna be cold, so you're gonna have to wear hats and gloves. Would that minimize the, the risk factor for those children on the bus? Or would we still have to quarantine 25 students as, as we saw in the thing? I'll defer to the experts. Yeah, so the, experts, I say. The, the bullets that were up there um, are ones that we had reviewed directly with Tyler. Um, the windows open is one factor that we have to consider. 
And yes, in that case, if they're wearing masks and in their assigned seat also, then that does, it does allow the air to flow better. So from what uh, we've talked about, then we can use that six foot rule where we could go, but it would still be those students in within that six foot okay. distance. Correct, am I, okay. <laughs> And we've heard some parents say, then why should, if, if my child still has to quarantine, why should they wear a mask? You know, and, and we've heard that a lot. Like, this is ridiculous. If, you know, they're wearing a mask all the time, they're less than six feet, and now they have to quarantine. And I guess the comment would be, it, you're exposed and you're quarantined, but if you don't wear the mask, the chance of you getting the virus is increased greatly. So we're taking this extra precaution to quarantine you, but if you don't have a mask on and you're around someone who's positive, chances are you're going to get it. If they're masked and you're masked, the chances of you getting it is reduced. Um, the quarantine part is brutal, we get that. But I think that's one thing that parents are kind of in their mind trying to, to work around is, then why should we all wear masks anyway? Because I have to quarantine. Well, you're not catching the virus and that's huge. Um, so I think that's part of the response that we give to parents. Um, one more question, if we can circle back to the um, junior high, possibly going four days a week. So what's, what are you looking, like what's the next step? Because I know we're coming up on ending the uh, quarter. So would that be something like possibly at the start of a quarter or like what are, what are the next steps? I, you know, I think it's going to come down to what are we seeing in terms of what's happening in our district in terms of the students that are positive and, you know, staff that's positive. Is that trending up or trending down? So we've got, a, you know, six weeks of history. We're in our seventh week. So we can begin to see where those trends are. I think what's happening in the community, we have to factor that because we'll see that kind of trend in our, in our schools as well. Um, so I, I think you know, looking at those two variables are, are important. I think talking to the Wood County Health Department about that and getting their feedback. I had a conversation with Dr. Hanrahan about just that question. You know, how to, when, what do we need to be looking at to bring folks back? Um, you know, so I, I don't think that we want to be, you know, pinpointing a time. There's some logical times like quarter, semester, where it makes sense. But, you know, we're beginning to enter this new phase where people are more indoors. We heard back in July that people were worried about the winter. And, and so is, is now the time to begin to incrementally build up. I, I, you know, so I think that um, collecting this data, evaluating it, bringing to the board, kind of this is what we're thinking, this is when we're thinking about it, and, and then taking those steps. That's how I kind of foresee it happening. Could I ask Tyler, do you have a recommendation on that? Or what, what, what's your thoughts on that? So I think that's a, a very important question. Um, we are actually today, I'm going to be trying to get you all an incidence rate, uh, which will make the numbers a little bit more comparable by zip code so that we can compare where Wood County sits overall as opposed to the entire state, but also where Perrysburg, uh, Bowling Green, where we're seeing the spikes increase. Um, I think this is something that honestly, one, if you make a decision at one point based off the data, we also have to be realistic that we might not see a spike or a valley for two weeks. Um, we were, saw a large increase in our university population and it became, okay, well, this is a university issue. This is no longer a county issue. The problem with that is those kids do not have a wall around that university. Um, and I will tell you now, we are seeing an increase in the Bowling Green area because of this university. Um, so with that all in mind, I do appreciate the kids, you know, benefit from in-person learning. Um, but I think it needs to just be an informed decision on associated risk and uh, versus the benefits that we're going to be weighing uh, against, you know, remaining in the current format or returning to full in person. I also think in regards to that, when does that happen? We bring back junior high, bring back high school. One of the things we said from the very beginning, Mr. Hosser, you pointed this out to us with the hybrid, it's not only just for the student's safety, which is very, very important for us, but faculty, staff, 
their safety also. And imagine if we start losing staff members because of quarantined or isolation. Um, substitutes, I see there's a need for substitutes, um, again, in our district. So it's just so many variables out there. And I have a question for Mrs. Reddick. Um, let's say there's no COVID. Can you describe your typical November, December, January season? Um, what, what exists in the school systems with respect to uh, your yeah. job as a nurse? Yeah, okay, so I'm almost gonna feel bad saying this, but every year at the beginning of the year, there is a viral thing that goes around and it starts with a sore, scratchy throat, goes up into the sinuses, they get congested, and then drops into the chest and you get a cough. And that cough can linger for two to four weeks. So when kids come to, the, were coming to the clinic and they were, you know, I woke up this morning, my throat's scratchy. It would be like, well, you don't have a fever right now. And I'm going to tell you, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. So try to hang in there for a couple of days because about day three or four, it's going to get really bad and you're going to wish you'd stayed home then. And that is, it's a new year. And now it's, it's not that at all. We can't, I mean, we can't dis distinguish between that type of a virus and COVID because symptoms are very similar. And, um, we need to get those students out before we have to shut down a whole building. And um, I am really concerned about what flu and cold season is going to look like because symptoms are so COVID-like. Um, and, and we'll be calling a lot of parents to pick up a lot of students. And this isn't the way we're used to operating. We're used to, you know, whatever we can do to keep you in class so you can keep that learning going and then at the end of the day go home and rest or you can rest on the cot for, you know, during study hall today and hopefully finish out the rest of the day. But it's, it's different. And so I am really worried. It's, it was an adjustment to have, you know, to come into school and have kids come in and start telling us symptoms. And, you know, we're required to put them in an isolation room and call the parent and have them picked up. But this is gonna ramp up a lot. And I think all the nurses are very concerned. It was hard enough to start and figure out how we're gonna deal with these symptoms. But now that we're going into a season where we're gonna see a lot more, it is very concerning. And you know, we're doing the best we can, but we're not, we can't diagnose. And um, they will you know, be sent out to do the either alternative diagnosis and negative COVID test or the 10 days. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I have just a quick question and I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm frustrated with myself with all the information that we've been given that I still can't answer this for myself. So just to be, to verify, I'm, um, uh, and, and I'm not even exactly sure how to w word this well, so you have person one, adult, child, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, they find out that person two that they've been around was, ex was exposed possibly in another situation to someone who now has to be tested for COVID and they are be so person two is now being required to test for COVID. What does that do to person one? Does person one who's asymptomatic, are they now quarantined too? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing no, is that correct? Correct, yeah, so that is, we have that happen all the time in the district and we're grateful that parents and students and staff report those to us because then we, we track them on what we call our indirect tab on our spreadsheet. So if they do become symptomatic in the future, we have that information, but they are allowed to turn, return to work or school as long as they're not symptomatic in any way. Okay. Yeah. All right. Maybe I was understanding more than I thought. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's that. <laughs> Good job, sir. And that's that family situation that someone asked about earlier, where yeah. you know, my, you know, a, a family of, uh, you know, with three children. Let's say one of them is attending BGSU, and that student was exposed to somebody, you know, on campus who's positive. So that child in your home has to quarantine. So the question we get is, well, what about the other children? Do they have to quarantine? And I think that is that person one, person two, and the answer yeah. is no. Now, if that sibling starts to exhibit symptoms, then everybody in that household would have to quarantine. Then you've got a more right. close connection. Yes. So one removed 
is is the is the key factor there. Okay. Yeah, be be vigilant, be alert, but Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See how well you did? You guys did really well. <laughs> I'm not a really good teacher, so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Right. So now I have to do is figure out if you're a person one or person two. There you yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything you guys are doing. I just, I cannot even imagine. Well, it always comes in at Friday at three. And it's always <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, and we're starting to, you know, one of the things that, that uh, AJ on the team has done, he's done a good job of kind of documenting in every building trends and looking at it. And we know probably two weeks after Thanksgiving, we'll see a spike because we saw our first spike with numbers um, two weeks after school began. So, so we we're already starting to think about that week, you know, in December and what that could look like. So, you know, so we're starting to learn more just with, what we're seeing with the data that we've experienced so far this year. So, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a handful of um, items, just timing-wise, um, that, that we're asking the board to consider, um, uh, mostly related to employment and HR type of functions. So. Okay, so items five one through five uh, through six four, consent agenda. Uh, is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? So move. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please, Mrs. Harrington. Mrs. Downs. Yes. Miss Larimer. Yes. Mrs. Eubank. Yes. Mr. Bennington. Yes. Mr. Pullman. Yes. And then we go to uh, board discussion 7-1 with Capital Conference. And uh, this year, of course, as everything else is, it's an experience online, virtual. Um, and we're asked to uh, appoint a delegate and an alternate. We do have a delegate, uh, Mrs. Larimer, is, uh, was asked to be uh, the OSBA delegate back in uh, January. And she said yes. And you're still good for that, Mrs. Larimer? We do need an alternate for the Capitol Conference, correct, Mr. Harrington? Well, they just like to have a backup, so if someone wants to put their name in, Sue's going to do it for sure, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody interested in being a backup to Mrs. Larimer? Kind of. Yeah, like nothing ever goes on in my life <laughs> that would be good. That's what makes me nervous. <laughs> I'll, I'll put okay, my name in. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'll just be the backup. Okay, I'll let Gretchen. Yeah, okay, yeah, Gretchen. Gretchen. Yeah, Gretchen's the backup. <laughs> All right. Just need a first and a second. <clears throat> okay. Don't get sick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's no vote here. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Can we just do one just to be sure? Because it's a, it's outside of the consent agenda, right? Yes. Yeah. So you, you need, need a motion to make her the alternate. Yes. So I move that Sue Larimer represent us as our primary delegate at the uh, 2020 Capital Conference with Gretchen Downs as her backup. Second. Second. What? Any yeah. discussion? Second. I just did. Yeah. yeah. So Kelly second. Okay. Okay. Roll call, please. <laughs> Mr. Bennington. Yes. Mrs. Eubank. Yes. Mrs. Downs. Yes. Ms. Larimer. Yes. Mr. Pullman. Yes. Thank you both for taking that on. Now, is there anything else that you want to say about that uh, convention? Just, you, you, you need know, to... I sent you all the information, so if you have a desire to participate, just let me know um, so we can get you your email registration and then kind of help you walk you through what, sh what you have to do when it's actually the time to, to attend. So it's you can virtual. only attend during those times it says, or you can watch it later? You can, you, if, we, if we sign you up, you can watch it later. Okay. So if you're interested, either way, just let us know. Okay, so it doesn't have to be those times where nope. it's going on they're going to record live. it for so, only okay. for so many days, though. Okay. So. It'll be online for so many days? Yes. And does the board, like, you have to have each individual sign? Yes. So, I, so if Sue signs up, I couldn't get in there and look at a session? No. no. Okay, I was wondering. <laughs> but after it's a, it's a group right after six. Oh, group right Empl after. Employees, so. Okay. Just let us know if you wanna. All right. 
participate. Anything else to discuss, board? Anything else you want to bring up before we adjourn? Okay, if not, a uh, motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Roll call, please, Ms. Harrington. Mr. Bennington? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Mrs. Downs? Yes. Mr. Pullman? Yes. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much for so. attending this morning. We'll see you in a couple weeks, if not before. I like your lightning. I think that's a really good analogy, and I think that that's something we can all use. We'll see you uh, soon.